My name is Hawk Jones, and I'll be the moderator for this Engineers Without Borders webinar, Water Supply, Part 3 of 3, Treatment. This presentation is one of the core programs in the expanding series of online, on-demand, continuing education programs created by Engineers Without Borders USA and presented by Contract Solutions Group. Before I turn the program over to our presenter, I'd like to make a couple of announcements regarding the program. As our program begins, you will notice the program itself will fill the majority of your computer screen. On the lower left of your screen, you'll see a pause play button. If for any reason you need to pause the presentation, simply click once on the pause button. To restart the program, simply click on the play arrow that will appear in the same place. If you need technical assistance, please click on the email link for client services at Contract Solutions Group located on our website pages. Or you may call us for assistance from 7 a.m. Pacific Time until 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time, Monday through Fridays. If you are disconnected from the webinar due to local internet issues, simply log back in through the Engineers Without Borders website and restart the program. After completion of the program, you'll be taken directly to the attendance reporting page. It is very important that you complete this short form and submit it immediately upon completion of the program to receive full credit for your participation in this program. If this step is bypassed, neither you nor your chapter will receive credit. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for the program. Anne-Marie Spexet is an engineer and software developer based out of Atlanta, Georgia. She received her BCHE in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota and her MS in environmental engineering from Rice University in 1999. Anne-Marie has been involved with EWB USA at the project and national levels since 2003, serving as a mentor to Rice University projects in Nicaragua, as well as working on professional chapter projects in Mali and India. She co-founded the Central Houston Professional Chapter and South Central Region and currently serves as the chair of the South Central Technical Advisory Committee and the Health and Safety Committee. Anne-Marie, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to be talking about water treatment options for our projects with Engineers Without Borders. This is part of our technical webinar series, so you can see on this chart the various webinars that we have on the top. We have water supply, water treatment, uh, structural engineering, construction, solar energy, sanitation, sustainability. Uh, you can see along the left-hand side the different types of projects that this webinar may be applicable to. Obviously, we're going to be very applicable to those who want to do water treatment projects or water supply projects in general. The goal of today's webinar is to provide some background information to assist the project team as they design their water treatment projects. Uh, this is part three of a uh, three-part series. It is not necessary that you have seen parts one and two in order to view this uh, webinar today, but it will help you if you see them all together, uh, especially part one. Uh, part two, I'll go into a second, in, into in a second. Uh, but first, let's talk about the outline for today's talk. We're going to start off with an introduction to the, the webinar, just talk about the various topics that we're going to cover. Then we're going to go into the general issues facing our water treatment projects. Then we're going to discuss point of use technologies versus community scale technologies and discuss source water protection, which is an issue that would face both uh, point of use and community scale treatment options. And then we're going to launch into a big discussion about treatment technology. Uh, we'll go through boiling, uh, cloth straining, chlorination, coagulation, the major technologies that affect our projects, that, that are used on our project sites. And then we'll wrap up with some lessons learned, and then there'll be a page on references if you want to go in and do your own independent research afterwards. Well, we won't cover some topics today. Uh, the very first thing that will become obvious after viewing this webinar is that we will not have covered every known water treatment technology. It's simply not possible in the time span that we have a lot. And we won't be covering treatments for heavy metals such as lead or mercury, or we won't be dealing with petroleum hydrocarbons or other contaminants because that's just too big a topic. Uh, we won't talk about pipelines and distribution systems because that is covered in part two, the water supply webinar. We won't be talking about assessing or selecting a water resource because that is part one of the series. We will not be going into a detailed design treatment systems. We are only going to do a general overview of the technologies. Uh, and finally, we won't 
really talk about how to perform an assessment for that, you really should consult the EWB USA uh, documents for the project process. And that will give you uh, some information that might help you. So first, let's start off with this slide. For those of you that have seen parts one and two, this will undoubtedly be familiar. But for those of you who are seeing the slide for the first time, I will explain. Uh, this slide gives you a general overview of a water supply system from a very um, conceptual level. We've chosen to break apart our understanding of water supply systems into two uh, categories a household scale model and a community scale model. Uh, in both uh, models, you have a source, be it a well, a spring, surface water, or rainwater catchment. But from there, if you're in a household scale model, what you have is a manual distribution system where the consumers are personally going to the source and collecting water in buckets or jerry cans and bringing them to the point of use, to their homes or to wherever it's being used, be it for watering animals or for washing clothes. At this point, this is where treatment would occur if uh, treatment is being applied to the water. Um, this is where they would do their boiling, their biosand filtration, uh, chlorination, uh, treatments like that. And at that point, it's either used immediately or it's kept in storage, generally in the container that it was transported in or in whatever it was disinfected in. Now, for the community scale model, things change a little bit uh, from the source. That's when it is pumped or drawn up via conduction line into a storage tank. And within the storage tank, typically, that's where treatment occurs. Uh, you have treatment systems on the larger scale, such as a slow sand filtration unit, UV, chlorination. That would happen in the storage tank. From there, it's kept in the storage tank at elevation until it is needed at which point it flows through the distribution line and is gravity fed to the consumer uh, where it is collected uh, from tap stands or from personal taps if you have run lines all the way into the houses. Like I said, this is a very general model of water supply systems. Obviously, you can have uh, systems that are somewhere in between both. Uh, a common theme that you'll see is a community scale system for the water distribution where the water is, is pumped or is sent through the system untreated until it reaches the consumer, at which point the consumer goes and applies the treatment on the household scale level. But it gives you a general idea of the two frames of mind that we're looking at when we're dealing with water supply systems. So in part one of this webinar series, we primarily talked about the source, uh, characterizing the demand for the source, that means talking to the communities, figuring out how much water they'll be using on a daily basis and for what purpose, uh, be it potable or non-potable use. Uh, we're also looking in this webinar about characterizing the source, how much flow, what are the water quality characteristics, and so on. In part two, this was our big plumbing discussion. Uh, this is where we talked mainly about the uh, community scale model. Uh, especially dealing with the conduction line and distribution system uh, and also the storage tanks. And that's where we work on all the calculations involved in creating a gravity-fed water supply system. And today, obviously, we will focus on water treatments. And again, we will break it up and keep in mind our distinction between a household scale and a community scale treatment system. Now, for those of you who have been with EWB for a while, um, who have worked on a water supply system, you will no doubt know that water treatment is one of the more challenging projects, um, if not from a technical standpoint, then from a project management and community organization standpoint. Uh, the biggest issues with water treatment projects uh, are listed here. You can see that a lot of them uh, or some of them are technical, but a lot of them have to do with uh, the community organization stand, standpoint, uh, making the connection with the community between water quality and health. Water treatment projects cost money. Um, that unlike, say, a bridge or a water tank where there is a single capital investment, water treatment systems have these ongoing operations and maintenance costs, which must be uh, 
taken on by the community in order for it to continue. So the community itself must realize the importance of why they have to have these treatment systems or else they're simply not going to continue funding them. Um, with a lot of treatment projects, again, you have to deal with the scale of it. Do you have a point of view system or a community system? Are you going to treat all the water or are you going to separate potable and non-potable systems? Um, that all enters into the operations and maintenance costs where, it, where the rubber hits the road and you calculate out how much it's going to cost per gallon to deliver the water. Who are you going to trust to collect these fees? Who's going to operate it? Uh, who, who's going to deal with the maintenance? Who's going to order consumables? Uh, who's going to make sure that all system users are covered adequately? Uh, other challenges, uh, more on the technology side, they include selecting the technology that's appropriate. Is it available locally? Will they be able to purchase uh, or replenish their materials? Uh, in the technology section, you also have to worry about the aesthetic concerns. This particularly comes up with the issue of chlorination, since there is a smell and a taste associated with it. Um, all of this. Uh, points to the education that you do in conjunction with your implementation of the water treatment project. Um, education and in particular follow-up. Uh, for these projects, it is essential that you have a reliable local NGO, that your community members are engaged, that there's adequate training, and that the water quality is uh, monitored continually so that you can get a feel for if the technology is being applied correctly, if it, it, it is valid across all seasons and across all demand levels, and just making sure that the system is being maintained continuously. So uh, talking about technology intervention, uh, one thing that will occur to chapters who do a water treatment project, again, is impressing the importance of our quality and health. Um, a lot of people will recognize it, obviously, but they won't necessarily understand the connection between keeping the, well, the area around the well clean. Will we, if you keep the area around the well clean, that will mean that the water inside it is kept cleaner and, therefore, contamination will less likely affect the consumers of the water from that well. Um, this is a huge educational hurdle that must be overcome. And pretty much every project that you do uh, involving water treatment will have a huge educational component to it. Um, as far as water tr the technologies for water treatment goes, again, just banging on the drum, you have two main uh, tracks that you can follow. There's a point of use track, uh, household level systems such as the MANS bio sand filter that you see in this photograph here. And then you have the community scale. Uh, these obviously aren't at an EWB project site, at least not one that I've ever been on. But uh, these are your larger systems. This is a, a very large flow sand filter and then a rapid sand filter at the bottom. These are systems that are meant to uh, treat entire communities, hundreds of, commun or hundreds of uh, consumers at one time, as opposed to the man's filter, which is only meant for a single family. Now, when you're looking at your technologies and deciding whether or not you're going to go for a point of use or community scale technology, uh, there are some considerations that you should have at the forefront of your mind. Uh, the first is that you really need to lay out clearly what your objectives are. Are you going to treat all of the water that's going into the system, or are you going to separate it and deal with potable water versus non-potable water? Uh, is, it, is it going to be used for drinking, or is it going to be used for you know drinking, cooking, and then also all of these non-potable uses, such as uh, watering livestock or watering uh, crops or, you know, other, other uses like cleaning. Um, there, there is a distinction to be made, and it can affect the price by a lot. Uh, the other considerations that you have to look at are who will be maintaining the system, 
if you're going to be doing a community scale system, you will um, certainly have to work with an NGO or a water uh, committee if you don't happen to have a community that's well organized to have to be able to support a water committee, you might just have a loose affiliation of households, or you might have just interested individuals. And for those uh, for those looser affiliations of people, you might want to consider just going with a point of view system that they can maintain themselves and they aren't reliant on the entire community agreeing to pay for and support this technology. Um, the other consideration is whether or not you're going to have long-term maintenance of the system. Uh, again, is the community organized enough to maintain the system? But aside from that, you also have to look at is the surrounding area able to support the, the technology? Uh, if you're doing coronation, are you going to be able to source the tablets if you're using a tablet feeder? Uh, this often comes into play for those that do UV systems. Uh, it can be very difficult to find the UV bulbs necessary uh, as these bulbs break, we'll be able to get replacements in. Just all the technical feasibilities, uh, whether or not you have the density and the availability of materials to support any given technology. So now we are going to go in and dig in and look at these technologies one by one. Uh, we are going to keep our distinction of point of use technologies and community scale technologies. As I go through the next uh, slides, you'll see on the upper left-hand corner that I've put point of use and community scale in the upper left-hand corner to kind of flag whether or not it would be considered a point of use technology or community scale technology. And keep in mind that when you're looking at these technologies, you often see multiple technologies applied uh, in order to get the appropriate quality. You often see, for example, flow sand filtration used in conjunction with uh, UV or in conjunction with chlorination in order to knock out the, the various things that, the various water quality issues that uh, exist within that supply. The first technology is really more of an administrative uh, thing that's going to arch over all water treatment projects. That's the issue of source water protection. Pretty much every water uh, supply project will have to deal at some point with protecting the source water. Uh, for surface water sources, this is going to involve delineating the watershed and finding out what activities are taking place within the watershed, uh, particularly above the point of capture. If you have activities such as cattle grazing near your stream, you will have to figure out how to deal with that. If you can do things like fencing off or marking off protected areas or prohibit certain activities near the area that you're capturing it, uh, that's, that's talk that will need to be had with not just your community, but perhaps surrounding communities. You might even have to get the local government involved with looking at these uh, watershed issues. You may not be able to get this done right away. These kind of discussions can take years and years to, to work out if they even can get worked out. But it's something that needs to be done if you're looking at a, a surface water system. If you're looking at a groundwater system, things can get a little bit easier. Uh, for groundwater systems, we're talking about wells or springs. You're mainly talking about establishing setback distances from your well, making sure that you're not near any sewer lines or latrines, making sure the livestock is being kept away, um, that you don't have any um, industry anywhere near your, uh, any light industry anywhere near your well, and that you're not near any septic tanks. Uh, with groundwater, you ha are also looking at the quality of the well itself, if it's hand dug or bored, if it's properly capped and sealed. Um, with hand dug wells, it can be very difficult to seal it to prevent water such as rainwater or surface water from filtering in through the top of the well into the aquifer. Uh, with bored wells, it can, it, it's much easier to sterilize it. So once you have the concrete pad in place and once you have the bore in place, what you do often is you do a shock chlorination where you put a bunch of chlorine into the well and then pump it out uh, to make sure that whatever 
bacteria is down there has been killed. And so uh, any, uh, so all the water that's flowing through that area is coming from the surrounding aquifer and not just water that is poured in from the, the top, which would be dirty. Uh, soil is very effective at removing bacteria. Bacteria is sticky on the outside, and it will tend to adhere to soil particles. This can take some feet, uh, typically a, a typical setback distance from, say, uh, a septic tank is about 75 feet. So if you keep your wells 75, say, 100 feet, uh, this can vary depending on the region you're in and the type of aquifer that you're in. But if you keep your wells a certain distance away from those activities, you can be not completely but fairly certain that the water that's in that aquifer, barring any influence from surface water coming from above, is clean, just bacterially speaking. Um, this can often involve decommissioning old wells and latrine pits, uh, dealing with uh, the community members, making sure that they understand what activities can't take place near that well. And that all falls into the right capture issues. Uh, who owns that well? Who can control what happens within the, the radius of that well? So coming out to our next issue, uh, our next technology, uh, boiling water is a common technology that most people have heard of. Uh, this generally treats bacteria, parasites, and viruses. Uh, the technology is straightforward. You take water, you boil it for a minute, depending on your elevation. Then you allow it to cool down, and then you can prevent recontaminating by covering the vessel. Uh, the problem with boil, using boiling as a primary treatment technology is that it requires a massive amount of fuel and a lot of time. So when dealing with boiling water as a technology, uh, we would generally only look at it as an emergency technology, something that you would only do in the case of a flood or disaster. Um, we wouldn't use it generally as an EWB technology for our communities. The next technology is cloth filtration. Again, another point of use technology. Uh, cloth filtration will remove parasites and suspended solids. Uh, in this, it's straightforward. You'd use a piece of fabric, fold it several times, and use it as a filter. Just pour the water straight through the cloth into your transport vessel. It's easy, but it's fairly low in effectiveness. Um, it is a small volume batch operation. so. We generally don't see that applied as a primary treatment technology. It's something the communities would do themselves. Chlorination is the popular technology. That's the one we see most frequently uh, being applied in our communities. Uh, chlorination will treat bacteria, uh, oasis, and viruses. Uh, with chlorination, you can apply it either in the form of tablets uh, you can apply it as liquid bleach. Uh, and what you do is you add it to the water and allow time for disinfection. Any unreacted chlorine that is put in the water is called a residual, and it would remain present in the water and just deal with any reinfections that might take place while it's in storage or while it's in a distribution system. If you're going to go with chlorination as a treatment technology, uh, we will generally ask, and you should, do a chlorine demand study in order to find out how much chlorine you need to use to treat your water. Uh, this is going to vary from time to time, and so you will have to do chlorine demand studies over time to determine how much is going to be dosed, and you'll probably want to teach the community members how to figure out how to dose it or what a minimum dose that they need to apply is. Uh, the benefits to chlorination is that it is a readily available technology. Most communities that you'll encounter at least know about chlorination. And the big benefit with chlorination is that there is a disinfectant residual presence in the water. So when, it's when the water is moved from container to container or as it flows through a pipe, it's not going to get recontaminated um, from something it encounters because that residual is still there to kill any bacteria that happens to get into the water. Uh, the big negatives to chlorination is, first and foremost, the cost. Uh, this is a continual cost.
going to have to continue to purchase bleach and tablets, and they are going to have to administer them correctly. Taste and smell can uh, become an issue. A lot of communities really don't like the, the taste. They, they aren't used to it, and they it's a, for those who have never had chlorinated water before, it can present a huge aesthetic issue that can drive them to a less safe source or just not to apply chlorination. Um, the issue of disinfection byproducts can be um, get, can come up when you're dealing with water that has a high organic content. Um, chlorination can also be applied on a community scale. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, we were looking at little tiny tablets uh, of chlorine that are put into water. That's for a family. This here is a Norico tablet feeder. These have much bigger tablets, and it's a time-release system. So water flows through that, that blue uh, box there. And as water flows through, the tablets are fed in and just dissolve over time. Uh, again, it, it treats the exact same things. It's basically meant to supply an entire community. Uh, with, with this particular system, thorough mixing is, is vital. Um, you're going to have to make sure that you don't have uneven distribution of the, the chlorination. This can be a particular problem if you're going to do chlorination uh, with, say, liquid bleach in a tank where you have an individual going up the hill in into the storage tank and just dumping bleach in uh, because that means that the, the disinfectant is applied at irregular intervals and that sometimes the water will be over chlorinated and present a stuck issue. Sometimes it will be under chlorinated and not have enough residual to disinfect everything so it's still bacteria in it. So in the case of chlorination at the community level, you really have to look at how the chlorine is distributed and who is responsible for maintaining the system. Um, same benefits and, and drawbacks as the point of view system, but with the addition that you're, you have to make sure that there's someone watching the system and monitoring it and making sure that it is being dosed appropriately. Our next technology is a coagulation and sedimentation technology. Uh, this is uh, part of what you've seen as the pure packets. If any of you have seen them in developing countries, they're these little packets. They have a coagulant and a bit of chlorine in it, so it's got a bit of a disinfectant as well. Uh, this treats all the same things as chlorination, but with the addition that it also treats turbidity. Uh, the idea is that the coagulant knocks out the turbidity um, as well. So if there's uh, sediments or small organics that are clouding up the water, if you put this in, that will make a drop out of solution and settle on the bottom of the, the containment vessel. Uh, the, the benefits to this technology is that it, it is an effective technology and that with the pure packets, you are getting a prepackaged dose. It's measured out, so you have as you can see, see in the instructions under the photograph, um, they, they tell you you have a 10 liter pail, you put this packet in, and you just stir it. And so it's measured out for a particular volume of water. The drawbacks to this technology are, again, the cost. You have to get these packets. Um, you have to purchase it. It does require some intervention by the user. They have to go get the packets, dump it in, stir it, um, make sure that they decant it properly so that they're not just dumping in whatever settles out at the bottom. Um, and they have to have continuous access to the packets, which can be a bit of a challenge. I've personally not seen pure packets in stores. So moving on, I haven't seen them in stores in those communities in any community that I've ever been in. Um, anyway, moving on to community coagulation and sedimentation. Uh, this is generally applied as pretreatment. Uh, coagulation is used if you're going to use a technology such as UV, which requires that the water be very, very clear, or if you're doing chlorination, where you still have to deal with a, a lingering um, turbidity issue. Chlorine won't solve turbidity, so you would do a pretreatment with coagulation 
to knock out the turbidity, and then you would apply your chlorination. Um, various coagulants, such as alum, or uh, there are these seeds called moringa olifera. Uh, you would mix them into the water, and the water, um, the, the suspended solids in the water flocculate. That means draw together into, it almost looks like snowflakes. And those things drop to the bottom of the tank, and then you can decant off the, the clean water from the top. Um, with coagulation, you do remove the turbidity, but there is uh, a cost associated with using the chemicals and also installing the tank to to dose the, the coagulants. You also need to continue. Same thing with uh, chlorination. You also need a continuous supply of the coagulants. Um, it's not just a one-time cost. Moving on, uh, this is a filtration technology. Uh, for those of you who have ever seen them, this is the Potters for Peace uh, technology, candle filters, or ceramic filters in general. Uh, you can see a candle filter on the left-hand side in the photograph, and then on the right-hand side, that is a Potters for Peace filter. Um, filtration treats bacteria, oasis, uh, parasites, suspended solids. The idea is more or less what you'd imagine. You dump the water into the top, and it goes through the, the porous media and is collected in the bucket below. So uh, I'll use the example of the Potter's for Peace filter. This Potter's for Peace filter is a terracotta pot, essentially. And so water can slowly seep through it. Uh, it's actually a little bit more porous than what you would normally use for a flower pot. By, just by the way that they manufacture it. But the idea is that you have this uh, ceramic pot inside this five-gallon bucket. Uh, when you put it in, you dump water into the top, into that pot. And over time, I believe it takes about two hours for a full pot to filter through, drip through that uh, ceramic into the, to the, the plastic bucket. And then it can be poured. You can use the little uh, spigots and pour off into a glass or into a, a cooking vessel. Uh, these filters are generally pregnant, impregnated with a bacteriocide. Uh, I know the Potter's for Peace filters use uh, silver, so there's silver in the pores, and that uh, c tends to kill bacteria. Uh, as far as candle filters go, it's generally the same technology as what you see in the Potter's Repeats. In this case, uh, water is poured in through the top. Uh, you can actually see the filter. If you look on the left photo, the thing that looks like a bunch of candlesticks there uh, is in, it's fitted inside the blue container. Water is poured in through the top, and it seeps up through the side of the candle filter. Uh, the idea with this is that you'll probably get uh, faster filtration through than you would through the Potter's for Peace filter just because there's more surface area. Um, but the, the concept is the same. The benefits to a filtration technology is that it is relatively low cost. Um, these Potter's for Peace filters or candle filters typically cost around $10 to $25 for the initial filter, and then replacement filters are 4 to $6. Uh, the filters do need to be replaced from time to time. Um, because sedimentation builds up. The idea with cleaning these is that every time you use it, you're supposed to take the filter out and scrub it with a, a stiff brush to get all of the uh, sediment out of the pores of the, the filter. And if you don't, over time, the sediment will just build up and cake on the inside of the pores, and then nothing will go through the, the filter. So they have to keep cleaning the filter. Otherwise, they'll, have, they'll either end up buying a new filter or you know, tossing it because it stopped working. But anyway, the benefits are that relative to other technologies is low cost. It is an easy to understand technology. Uh, most communities tend to understand what's going on with it. Um, in some countries, particularly in Latin America, you can find local manufacturing and distribution systems. Um, and it is a household level treatment. So you don't need an entire community to buy into this technology. You can just get a few 
uh, community members brought to school to get these filters and test them test them out, and if it works for them, they can keep using it. Otherwise, they don't have to. The considerations with this technology, again, filters mm -hmm. with effectiveness over time need to be replaced. I believe they need, even if you treat them well, they need to be replaced on the order of one to two years after you start using them, just like your Brita filter. Um, they do require maintenance. They can crack, become contaminated. Um, it is limited volume. Like I said, that the, the Filtron bucket is maybe about, I think it's a five-gallon pail, maybe a little bit smaller. So you are talking about a batch operation. Suspended solids will clog the filter over time. There is no residual. So whatever is getting siphoned off into a container, if that container is dirty, there is no additional uh, treatments applied to it. And uh, these filters don't deal with chemical contaminants. Uh, the next technology is slow sand filtration. Slow sand filtration uh, deals with bacteria, oasis, parasites, and suspended solids. With this technology, the pressure moves the water through a sand bed where, like in a groundwater system, bacteria sticks to the sand grains, and then suspended solids are just filtered out, and so you're pulling off from the bottom of the, the filter, and that's to be cleaned. Um, you will have to do some preparation of the media, making sure that the, the filter is packed properly and also sized so that the grains are sized properly uh, so that you don't have any channels running through it or that there's no void spaces within your filter. Filters can also be augmented, have some additives that may allow you to have a shorter filter bed, such as granular activated charcoal. I've also heard of some filters using the silver as well for bacteria, but I'm not sure how effective it is to do that. The benefits to slow sand filtration are that it is easy to, tr to maintain once the user is trained. The media really doesn't need to be replaced once you have it packed. It's generally good to go. Uh, it doesn't require energy if you have a gravity system. And uh, it uses physical straining, and then there are biological processes uh, the Schmutzdecker will explain in the next slide, and that will remove some uh, chemical contaminants as well. Uh, the considerations for slow sand filtration are, as its name implies, it's slow, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 cubic meters per hour, which is fairly slow, especially if you're dealing with a community-wide system. There is a high initial cost in that you have to build this filter bed, and there is a lot of effort going into sieving out the sand and packing it. Uh, you may not be able to find the suitable media uh, to do this. Some people think that all you have to do is, you know, if you're on a beach, just throw beach sand into your filter and that it will work. Um, it may, you may be able to get some filtration off of it, but it will definitely not be optimal. Uh, you may have to do some sieving, and that can be very labor intensive depending on the size of your slow sand filter. If you're running high turbidity water into a slow sand filter, you can cog it, and you'll have to do some backwashing, and that can lead to cogging. Or you'll have to do some, you'll have a clog, and then you'll have to backwash it. Uh, final consideration of sand filtration is, again, there's no residual associated with this technology. Moving on, uh, that was the, com the community level sand filtration. This is biosand filtration. And many of you um, might have seen one of these before. This is a very popular technology applied on EWB sites. Uh, biosand filtration treats bacteria, oasis, parasites, and suspended solids. It is essentially a slow sand filter in miniature. Um, this particular design is attributed to a person named MANS, therefore it is called the MANS Biosand Filter. Um, this is a variation. The idea here is that he is encouraging the growth of the biological scum layer. So if you look in the photo, or if you look in the diagram on the left, what do you see? This is the inside of a biosand filter, and the idea is that you lift the lid on the filter and dump your water in. The water flows through this diffusion plate, with, uh, which ox oxygenates the water and it then collects on top of this layer of fine sand. And you can see that there will be uh, 
free water floating at the top of the sand filter. In this uh, water that's sitting here, a mat of biological, or a mat of, of bacteria will form at the top. Uh, the diffuser plate is also in place so that you don't uh, break apart the biological mat. The biological mat uh, grows predatory microorganisms that will eat uh, the bacteria that you're dumping into it. So it's it's like you're you're growing a little army of soldiers that are sitting at the top of this layer of water that are attacking the water that you're dumping into it. Um, and the reason behind this is that it will shorten the length of sand that you need to trap the living bacteria because this Schmutzdecker will have killed off a lot of the bacteria before it goes into the sand filter. And so it will gravity feed down through this filter layer into the coarse sand, into the gravel, and uh, as you, it will push up into the pipe and then flow at the top. So in order for water to come out of this filter, you have to add water in through the top. So as you can see, the, the top of the pipe is right where the level of the water is. So you don't get water coming out unless you put water in. The benefits to this technology is that it is a fairly low cost technology. Um, this technology is often built on site. Uh, these uh, tanks are made of concrete. And so a lot of EWB chapters uh, work on building molds to construct these filters on site and build 10, 20 of them at a time and distribute them to households. They are fairly e easy to maintain once the user is trained. Uh, the media, again, doesn't need to be replaced. There is some maintenance involved in uh, removing any sediment that has been trapped at the top of the sand layer. Uh, you may have to decant out some uh, fine sediments that are built up over time. But in general, you don't have to constantly repack the biosand filter. Uh, it does provide mechanical removal of parasites. It will just be trapped uh, in the top of the sand layer. Uh, you can get some significant flow coming through these. Not a lot, but good enough for a family. Uh, 20 liters per hour is possible, although I've never actually seen it being used continuously like that. And again, it uses locally available resources, so these uh, filters can be built on site. The consideration with biosand filters is that there is a lot of user training involved. Uh, we've seen biosand filter implementations go wrong where uh, one of our chapters goes and constructs 60 filters at once and distributes them to everyone in the house or everyone, every household in the community. And the community really doesn't quite understand the technology, doesn't understand the need for it. And so you, they'll come back six, seven months after the initial implementation to find out that a lot of the filters ended up being flower pots just because the educational component wasn't there strongly enough. With biosand filtration, proper media selection is absolutely critical. This is, again, not a technology where you can just dig up beach sand and dump it into the filter and expect that it will work. If you have high turbidity water, um, which will be common if you're dealing with a surface water source, these filters will clog up quickly, and you'll need to instruct community members how to constantly decant off the sediments from their filter um, or do some kind of pretreatment where they can get the, the turbidity out before they dump it into the filter. There is no residual in this technology just like all the others. So it is often recommended that you have some post-filtration disinfection, a little bit of chlorine, just to keep, make sure that while the water is sitting in the storage container, it doesn't grow more bacteria. Uh, it doesn't deal with chemical contaminants for the most part. And the most important consideration with these biosand filters is that the Schmutzdecke, the thing that allows this filter to be so short and allows um, these filters to be used in households because they're so short, is that the Schmutzdecke or the biological layer takes some time to form. It can take about two weeks 
two to three weeks to form it so that it is producing water safe enough to drink. Moving on, uh, we're going to talk about UV disinfection. First, let's talk about the point of use. UV disinfection, uh, UV will treat bacteria for the most part, and that's it. Uh, the idea here, and I think a lot of people have seen this, you take a clear plastic bottle, fill it with water, you can paint one side black, um, but I think they found that you don't really have to do that. But you take this clear bottle of water and you put it up on uh, a tin roof, anywhere where it can get a lot of sunlight. And it's stored in the sun for six hours on a clear day. It can take uh, several more hours if you're on a cloudy day. And it's exposed to sunlight. And the UV uh, rays penetrate through the, the, the plastic bottle. Uh, kill the bacteria that's inside it. Um, then you can bring the bottles down after those hours and cool them down and then drink them just as you would any normal bottle of water. And the benefits to this technology, it's low cost and it can be performed with local materials if you have a lot of plastic bo bottles available um, you know, through various means. It is a fairly low maintenance technology. Um, you can get communities to put bottles on the roof. It's, it's not a technology that requires a lot of uh, care and maintenance. And because the bottles are a single serving size, they are very convenient. And so after the, the UV is disinfected, it, because they're sealed up, you won't have the same problem of reinfection that you have with a lot of the other technologies. And the considerations with UV disinfection are that this technology does require consistent strong sun. If you are in a place with a lot of clouds, UV disinfection will still work, but it can take much longer, two to three times longer, to have the same level of disinfection that you would with a, if you were in a clear, sunny place like a desert. Um, there is limited volumes, and it's a batch operation. As you can see, you can't. You can't exactly treat an entire community's uh, water supply using nothing but these little plastic bottles. Um, it does only remove microorganisms, so any kind of uh, turbidity issues that you have will still be present. Um, and as such, it is ineffective for turbid water. If you have water that's 30 nephilometric turbidity units or above, this technology is inappropriate. Uh, the final issue with UV disinfection is that these plastic bottles will decompose over time from the UV exposure. They'll just become brittle and fall apart. And it doesn't take all that long. I don't know. I've never seen a study that said how long exactly they last, but it's not much more than a few weeks before the bottles need to be replaced. Now moving on with a different type of solar treatment. Uh, this is solar distillation. And this is not the same as UV disinfection. Uh, in solar distillation, this treats pretty much everything except for any uh, volatile contamination. Um, it'll treat the bacteria, the cysts, the parasites, especially suspended solids. It's very good for that. In this technology, water is just put into a shallow tray, and solar energy is allowed to penetrate through the top, generally through a glass or clear plastic roof. And the solar energy just heats up the water. And the water evaporates, hits the bottom of the clear top, hits the bottom of the glass, and drains off into a containment vessel. Uh, this is a very good technology if you're in a hot environment, if you're in, say, a desert. And it is very good with salinity issues. Um, you can see there, there are two different variations on this technology. The one on the left, obviously, it was constructed with glass and uh, wood. They just uh, created the, the back and the bottom with wood. And then there's a pane of glass over it. And you can see they dump the water. They lift the lid. The lid uh, is on a hinge, so it pulls up. They dump the water in. And the, uh, the sediments are just left at the bottom, which can be brushed off or scraped off over time. And then the purified water goes into the little buckets. The one on the right is a interesting little emergency 
solar still. I think it's meant to be used in life rafts. But the, the principle is the same there, where you can put in seawater, and it evaporates off, rolls off the top, and then goes into uh, a little bottle there and can be safe to drink. So it's a fairly low cost and easily constructed with local materials. It will remove dissolved solids, which is very good. It will, it, it, as I said, it's very good for salinity issues, which are pretty much impossible to treat by all the other technologies that you've seen previously. And it's fairly low maintenance. The big consideration is the strong sun. Uh, if you don't have it, this isn't going to work at all. Um, if you are in a place that's cold, it's not going to work very well at all. Uh, it does deal with limited volume. It is still a batch operation. There is, again, no residual. With solar distillation, you do have to deal with algae growing in the, the bottom of the, the still. And you still have to deal with the removal of the, the sediments that come off your distillation. And it doesn't handle volatile chemical contaminants, though. To, to a large degree, it probably will, um, just not as thoroughly as you might. If you actually have a volatile chemical problem, you might not be able to, to handle it with this. Uh, moving on in our UV slash solar technologies is the big one, uh, UV disinfection. Uh, UV disinfection is very good for bacteria, and the idea, along with the UV uh, st or the UV uh, disinfection that you saw two slides go. It works by basically giving the bacteria sunburn. Uh, the UV penetrates through the bacteria cell walls and scrambles the DNA so they can't reproduce and eventually die. Um, so as the water flows through the cell, uh, it is exposed to a chamber containing a radiation source, which is generally a bulb. And this bulb is shining through uh, the water and disinfects it. So the incoming water has to be very clear in order for this technology to work. Uh, you can see the parameters here. The total dissolved solids, or TDS, has to be below 500 parts per million. TSS, or total suspended solids, has to be below 5 uh, nephilometric turbidity units, which is very low. You have to have very low iron hardness and very low fulvic or humic acids. Fulvic or humic acids um, are those chemical compounds in water that make it brown, so kind of like tea. So when you have leaves falling into water and then the water turns brown from the leaves, that's the fulvic and humic acids. So it has to be fairly colorless water. It has to be fairly chemically clean. Uh, in terms of the iron and the hardness, and it has to have very low turbidity, um, which again goes with the clear, uh, in order for this technology to work. You can buy this technology in the US. Uh, this is a photograph of a home system, and you can get them for $1,500 here in the US. Uh, the benefits to this technology is that it is effective. Uh, it is a fairly low-maintenance technology when it's working. Um, water just continually flows through the cells and, and then can be dumped off into a tank for later consumption. It is a continuous processing system. So as water flows through the system, it's just continually exposed to this UV radiation and disinfected. There are no chemicals involved. so. It, Aesthetic reasons are are going to be an issue on your project. This might be something to consider. It is very compact and self-contained. I believe this this particular system. Well, you can see the power cord for scale. It's pretty small, so it would definitely fit inside a, a room if you needed to. And there's no disinfection byproducts or taste issues associated with this technology. The big issues with UV disinfection are on the right hand side there. It requires a stable source of electricity. That's the biggest issue. Um, in most of the areas where we have our projects, a continuous stable source of electricity is pretty much impossible to find. Um, and so your UV disinfection system will turn on and off over time, which is bad, because then if you have any water released into that storage tank that is untreated, it will just regrow bacteria. 
which is not good. Uh, the other consideration is the replacement parts. And in this, I'm particularly referring to the bulbs. Uh, UV disinfection bulbs are very difficult to find. Uh, if you're in large cities, you might be able to get replacement parts fairly easily. But definitely, if you're in the rural areas, these UV bulbs, are you're not going to find them at the corner store. Um, and that's going to be a huge problem when these bulbs break, and they eventually will break. The next issues with this technology involve the turbidity and the dissolved sol solids issue. Uh, this technology is one that will almost certainly require some pretreatment, um, and unless you have particularly clean water, which means that you almost certainly have a, a groundwater source. And even then, even if you have the groundwater source, you still have to deal with the iron issue and the hardness issue. Um, with this technology, training and, mon and in particular monitoring is required uh, for this technology to work. You have to monitor to make sure that the bulbs are being kept clean, that the, the flow cell is being kept clean. Because again, if the, if the bulb is, if, if the area cover is, if the area over the bulb is covered with dirt, uh, this technology will definitely not work. It will just lose effectiveness over time and then stop working. UV, UV disinfection will also not deliver a residual. And in general, um, it will not indicate when the system isn't running. So if the bulb breaks, this, these systems won't generally give off a warning signal. Uh, this may have changed over time. But as far as I've heard, I've never heard of a, a UV system that has had a siren go off when the, the bulb breaks. And also, the issue with this is if you have your UV system off in some shed that nobody goes into, they're, they're not going to hear the siren or the bell or the blinking light. So they won't necessarily know when the UV stopped working. And then again, UV won't deal with any con chemical contaminants. And so with that, uh, we've gone through I'd say 95% of the treatment technologies that we've seen on AWB projects. Now, the next few slides are going to deal with um, specific issues, uh, specific chemical issues with uh, our water projects, and in particular, arsenic and fluoride. So arsenic and fluoride are both minerally occurring in groundwater. Uh, it's very region specific. Some locations will have an arsenic problem or a fluoride problem. Some will not. You can actually look on maps to see if your region has these issues. Uh, arsenic is highly toxic and can cause birth defects, uh, reproductive problems, and physical symptoms such as keratosis. You can see a photograph of keratosis on, if you look in the yellow side, if you look on the right, the person showing their palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. Uh, you can see what looks like clods of dirt on their hands and feet. Those aren't, it's not dirt. It's actually um, skin that's kind of built up and calloused in, in a very strange way. That's keratosis. Um, the other, that, that's merely a symptom. The real problems are the birth defects and the other symptoms that come along with it, along with just arsenic being a very toxic uh, mineral in water. Uh, you should consider doing arsenic testing whenever you're drilling a well for a project, or if you're in a region known for arsenic contamination, or if you're in the vicinity of anywhere where arsenic contamination is known to be an issue. In particular, uh, mining operations or metal plating facilities are known to have issues with arsenic contamination. Now, fluoride, uh, you can see the effects of fluoride contamination on the right, on the orange side of the slide. Uh, fluoride is added, of course, to our water supply system in very low concentrations. It's a common additive. Uh, we use it to strengthen our tooth enamel. And it works in low concentrations. However, in higher concentrations, much higher than what you see in our water supplies, in those higher concentrations, Excess fluoride can cause a disease called fluorosis. And this disease actually damages teeth and bones. You can see um, in the photograph, uh, the teeth become mottled and brown and very soft. Not, not soft that you can bend it, but 
they just become soft and easily damaged. And then on the, the right, you can see the boy, his skeleton has been deformed uh, by fluorosis. It's just become very soft and has deformed from the, the weight. Um, as far as fluoride goes, again, you should consider doing a fluoride test if you're going to drill a well, or if you're in any region known for having a fluoride contamination issue. Again, you can look on maps or just look at fluoride contamination for your country. It's, it's very specific to certain regions. So you can, you can see if it's something that you need to be concerned about or not. As far as treating for arsenic goes, there are several methods that you can use to, to deal with arsenic contamination. There's adsorption with activated alumina, there's ion exchange, there's membrane separation. But the one we're seeing a lot of uh, with our EWB projects is iron coagulation. And you can see, it, see an example of this technology right there. Um, it's a low cost, it, of all of these, it's the lowest cost treatment solution. Well, it's a really interesting chemical reaction between arsenic and iron oxide, where when arsenic in solution uh, comes in contact with rust or iron oxide, it will precipitate out. And when it does, that's when it can be removed from water. What you're looking at in the photographs is a biosand filter that has had nails and iron scrap added to the top of it. So as water is being poured in from the top, it can it gets in contact with the iron oxide as the metal scrap in the top, and you can see it's bright orange. And when that water hits the iron oxide, it co-precipitates out and is captured in the top of the filter, which is a sand filter, like any just like a normal bio sand filter. And it's the sand filter also takes out any bacterial contamination present in the water. So that's an example of arsenic, a low-cost arsenic treatment solution. Fluoride is a bit trickier to remove uh, from, from water. You have several options. You have adsorption onto granular activated alumina. You can see activated alumina on the, the left there. There's ion exchange, membrane separation, and distillation filtration. Uh, just like solar distillation that you saw on a previous slide. Of all of those technologies, the most common that we've seen is uh, granular activated alumina. Uh, activated alumina is good at removing all types of uh, ions, including arsenic, fluoride. You can use it to remove phosphates, copper lead, pretty much anything that ionizes. Um, however, you will have to have some pretreatment of the filter bed in order to remove any competing ions, um, and that will increase your bed life. These filter beds do uh, become spent over time as it gets filled up with ions, and so they will have to be regenerated. And this is quite a large scale operation. You'll have to go through and back filter it with lye solution, sulfuric acid, or alum to uh, get your uh, get the fluoride off of it, and then you have to deal with um, the the solution, your washing solution, and figure out a way to dispose of that. But fluoride can be treated through various technologies, and we're just trying to show you one example of that technology here. Uh, see that you may or may not see on an EWB project site is reverse osmosis. And this will be the final technology that we talk about today. Reverse osmosis treats chemical and mineral contaminants such as nitrates, arsenic, fluoride, heavy metals, total dissolved solids, and saline. It treats pretty much everything. Um, the idea with reverse osmosis is that water is pressurized and forced through a semi-permeable membrane. The filters are uh, size excluders. So only little tiny molecules like uh, water, H2O, will be able to pass through the membrane. Everything else is, the rest of the water is trapped on the other side along with all the contaminants, all of your nitrates or your heavy metals or your um, saline. 
is stuck on the other side. So only clean water can pass through it. So what you're left with is clean water on one side of the filter, and then everything you're trying to remove plus water on the other side. So the water that filter is pretty much stripped of mineral content. And it's the point where it's too clean. Um, if you were to drink it, it, it would actually cause a problem in your system because you need to add back, you need to have a certain amount of minerals in your water or else you get very, very sick. So with reverse osmosis systems, you have to blend water back into your, your, your cleaned water in order to prevent those mineral deficiencies. Now, the benefits of reverse osmosis is that this technology is available in some countries. Uh, I've seen reverse osmosis systems in India. You can see them in uh, some Latin American countries. It is an available technology in some places, and it can provide a very high quality of treatment. Uh, the water that comes off of it, like I said, it's so clean that you have to add water back into it in order to provide the mineral content. Uh, the issue with reverse osmosis is that, you know, like UV, it requires electricity and it requires replacement parts. Uh, at some point, you will have to replace the membranes. Uh, you will have to do some maintenance to the system. The, the big, one of the other big issues with reverse osmosis is that it requires a lot of water. Um, what you're seeing there, that ratio, is the ratio of the water that you need to the water that you get out of the system. So for three parts of water, you only get one part of water that's actually cleaned up. The rest of it, it has now a higher concentration of the saline or the nitrates or the arsenic or whatever it is that you've, you're trying to remove. And you're going to have to figure out what to do with that rejected water. Um, in some cases, you might not be able to get rid of it. Uh, easily, you might not be able to just dump it. This is a particular problem with highly saline water. Um, if you're trying to use reverse osmosis on seawater, for example, you've now created this highly, th this clean water, but then you have this highly saline water that you've now got to dispose of. And you can't just dump that because then you'll kill off plants or cause damage to uh, surrounding aquifers. So you, you have to deal with the issue of the, the rejected water. Like all of the um, other filtration technologies, reverse osmosis provides no residual protection, so the water can get uh, recontaminated later on. RO requires trained operators to maintain the system and make sure that replacement parts are being installed at the correct time. And uh, reverse osmosis, because it's such a so good at removing these contaminants. Uh, if you don't do some pretreatment uh, for for your uh, contaminants, these filters will clog up very quickly. So if you have a lot of turbidity in your system, you'll want to take that out before the water goes through reverse osmosis. Otherwise, uh, the filters will just clog up immediately. So that completes our tour of all the water treatment systems. Uh, let's move on and talk about testing. Um, if you haven't, if you've learned nothing from the rest of this talk, what you need to take away from this is that you need to know about these technologies and you need to be aware of their sensitivities uh, in terms of the water quality. Um, in particular technologies such as UV, ion exchange, reverse osmosis, biosand filter. It, it is very dependent on the quality of water that goes in um, to how effective these technologies will be. So uh, if you're going to do, if water treatment is something that you anticipate your project to have in the future, you really should start sampling and testing your water from the assessment trip from the very first time you go to your project site, you should begin testing your water and making sure that you're sampling at regular intervals. I know some project teams only go out during certain times of the year, like the dry season. Uh, so it's, it's important to have a sampling program that deals with the different, area, the different source areas. If you're drawing from several different sources, for example, you're drawing from a well as well as a river, your sampling program needs to look at both of those sources. Uh, you need to look at the different distribution systems, the tanks and the tap stands, 
and you also need to look at the the trans the transport containers. Um, again, for teams that go out only during specific times of the year, you should know that water quality can vary dramatically over time. It can vary dramatically by season, by day, with weather events. So if you are a team that only travels once a year or if you don't have a, a local NGO that can do testing, you really should consider leaving some testing equipment with locals to continue testing after you go home just so that they can report any seasonal or daily variations in your water quality. You really don't want to design treatment technology all around one sampling point for water quality, especially if you can anticipate large variations. One thing that I would recommend that you do is when you go out and do your water testing uh, program, you should bring a GPS with you and tie your water samples to GPS coordinates. Uh, you can learn a lot by doing that, especially if you're dealing with groundwater sampling. If you're looking at different households, you can get a good idea of how effective your treatment program is uh, by testing over time and seeing how the water quality uh, ties in with the health of a particular family. So when you go out and do your water sampling, uh, bring the GPS with you. And I actually recommend that you tie the water sampling with the health survey. Uh, I, I find that they, they go well together. So if you have a three-person team, you can have one person who's generally the, the translator, uh, one person to do the health survey. Then you can have one person running around during the health survey, running around that household after the health surveyor has explained what you're doing. You can take the sample from the water source from their well. You can take a photograph of their well. And you can take a GPS reading all at once. And then you have one person still there to record notes, record you know, the happenings of the health survey, uh, record GPS coordinates, and um, record anything that you can take on site, such as temperature or dissolved oxygen, anything like that. Uh, you can see there on the right-hand side the list of water quality parameters that we at EWB recommend that project teams take. You might not be able to get all of these. Some of these may not make sense for your project site. Uh, but this is, these are the most common water quality testing parameters that we recommend. Uh, there is a guidance sheet that you can refer to available from EWB USA's website uh, where you can get more information on these parameters and the types of tests that you can bring with you on site. So to wrap up this talk today, uh, we're going to go through some lessons learned from the experiences that we've had at EWB with our water treatment projects. Um, the most important lessons learned are listed on this page here. Uh, the biggest that I would say for teams who are just getting started with their projects is that you need to start your measurements, especially your water quality measurements, at the assessment trip. It is absolutely uh, vital that you start collecting useful data from your very first trip. We have had many projects where the team has gone, spoken to the locals, looked at, gotten the lay of the land, but they didn't actually take water quality parameters. And then they came back to the US, designed a system, assumed some water quality parameters, and then came up to the TAC and then realized that they just didn't know enough about their system. And when it came up to, to go out and do the implementation, that they just didn't know about their, enough about their system to correctly size or correctly choose the technology. So then they would have to go out again. Um, the other thing, again, with seasonal variations, you may have to go out once or twice or even three times uh, before you can select an appropriate technology, treatment technology, uh, because, again, the variations in source water quality. Uh, the next lesson learned, or the next few lessons learned, are really more about the administrative issues with running a water treatment project. Uh, treatment projects that don't take into account the operations and maintenance costs are almost always going to result in abandoned projects. Uh, communities with water treatment projects will always have to deal with the maintenance costs associated with the project, be it bulbs or 
chlorination tablets or uh, any kind of uh, filtration technology, they're going to have to purchase replacement uh, parts. This goes along with supply, si supply chain issues. If they can't get their supplies, they're going to not be able to do the replacements when they need to. It needs to be a consistent supply, of, especially if you're doing things like little packets, like pure packets. If they can't get those packets, then they'll use the packet once and never use it again, which is not going to be a viable long-term solution. Um, the final thing, uh, if you're going to do a community-based system, you absolutely need a working water board. You need people in charge, people that are trusted within the community to deal with collecting fees, ordering up supplies, maintaining the system. Otherwise, your project is doomed to failure. Uh, here are some examples of projects. Real, these are real EWB projects and uh, some of the things that have happened uh, with water treatment projects. Uh, the first example is Peru. Uh, this was a biosand filter project. Uh, they went through and uh, decided on biosand filters. They went in to their trip uh, thinking about it, and then they realized that there was no sand anywhere near their project, so that they were going to have to ship sand to their community and that that was going to be very expensive just to ship in sand. Uh, this goes back to the issue of looking at what is available to your project. A biosand filter project is great, but if you can't, if you can't source the materials locally, it's going to be difficult not only for you to implement your project, but if there's any need for expansion of the project or if the community wants to expand the project, they won't be able to because they won't have the resources that you will have uh, in order to source these materials. The next project, it's the Dominican Republic. This is a UV project. Uh, they found a way uh, to get, actually get UV bulbs to their project site regularly. Um, the issue with this is even though they got the bulbs to the community uh, as they, they needed to, Nobody was watching the system, and nobody replaced the bulbs. Uh, they need to have their O&M costs figured out, which at least they figured out a way to get the bulbs to the community. But in this case, uh, they needed to figure out the maintenance materials. And in this case, the material was the person to go look at the system and make sure the, the bulbs are working and make sure everything was getting replaced in a timely fashion. Next project, uh, we've had quite a few with uh, pilot biosand filters. Ken Kenya and Tanzania are just two examples. We've had, I think every country EWB has been in, there's been at least one biosand filter project implemented or attempted to implement. Um, this is purely an educational lesson. Uh, a lot of the time that they would just implement the technology, but they would not have the, the necessary training, and they wouldn't have the consistent uh, training to just remind people to use the biosand filters and keep using them. Biosand filters, because they have that biological component, that schmutzdecke, you have to keep pouring water through it uh, in order to uh, feed your bacterial layer. Otherwise, it's going to die off, and again, the filter will become ineffective. So you really do need to train the community in this technology and have them understand both the technology itself, but why they're doing it, and what what it takes to keep it going. Um, so that that was the issue with that with those systems. Um, we've had a lot of projects again. Um, you know, much like biosand filters, the the other most popular technology is definitely chlorination. Uh, we've had a lot of projects install chlorination systems where the community simply didn't understand the importance of the technology. They didn't they they were told that chlorination was a great technology and that everybody should have it, and that's what all the the cities use. So they said, okay, we'll use chlorination. But they really didn't understand it. They didn't understand what was happening with their water and why they were getting sick. It, it ties back to the importance of tying public health or the health of the community 
to uh, the quality of the water. Um, so when you implement these chlorination systems, there is an initial issue with making sure that there's a proper dose making sure that the community understands that there is going to be some taste and smell associated with the chlorine, um, making sure that someone's regularly dosing it at the, the proper intervals. Uh, this all comes into training, and there is a long-term training associated with almost every water treatment technology that I've discussed here. So having talked about some of the, the projects that have failed. Uh, I don't want to end on a sour note, so I'm going to talk about the things that all of our water treatment, all of our successful water treatment projects have had in common. Uh, we've always had a very low, involved, engaged local NGO working with the community uh, on our water treatment projects. Uh, if not an actual NGO, then it was local community members who were very engaged and very uh, dedicated to making sure that these technologies take hold and are being used consistently and correctly. Uh, the successful projects have had water testing, and they determine the appropriate treatment technology. They have chosen the appropriate treatment technology based on their water quality testing. Um, one thing that was a notable was that water treatment was not the first project they attempted to implement in the community, and it wasn't the last. This goes on, on to the subject of being consistent, making sure that the community is engaged in the project. Uh, water treatment not being the first project means that EWB was there and the community has developed a, a trusting relationship with uh, us and they understand why treatment is necessary and they've kind of been brought to a place where they accept the idea of paying for water treatment. Um, with water treatment not being their last project, uh, it, it means that the EWB project team re kept returning to the site and kept talking to the community and making sure that it was impressed upon them to keep going with the treatment, that it is working and it is being effective. Um, the team addressed both the technology and the behavioral aspects of water treatment and sanitation. Again education heavily emphasized in successful water treatment programs. Uh, along with thorough health assessments, this brings it back to tying water quality to health, uh, making sure that the communities understand that if you treat water, health will improve. And this is, this is a, a strong tie that needs to be established in the minds of the people who will be paying for these systems. There were solid lines of communication between the project team and the community. Again, they had some means of talking to the community and letting them know what needs to happen to these systems as they were going on. Uh, project team is able to speak the local language or a translator source. This, again, goes to the education and training aspect to it, to, to a treatment system. Uh, the team returned to the site for years, uh, local materials. The locals were engaged. The project team had experience in water treatment systems. It's pretty much impossible to know the pitfalls of a water treatment system if you've never seen water treatment systems. That's why it's probably, for those EWB chapters who are engaging in their very first project, a water treatment system might not be the first thing that you want to leap into. Uh, you might want to start off with some other projects. And while you're at the, those project sites dealing with these projects, you might want to go to local communities in the surrounding area and just look at their treatment systems. What are the other communities in the area doing? Just so you can get an idea of what is effective. You know, the marketplace is a very, a very good way of filtering out bad technologies. It, a good technology will find its way to these areas. And oftentimes, if you go to the, the wealthier parts, maybe in the same country, you will be able to pick up the technologies that appear to work for them and figure out what can be sourced in the area. So that's why you might want to hold off uh, after maybe one or two implementations to launch into a water treatment project. And then finally, uh, the project team had multiple members or multiple mentors, uh, members who were experienced in, in water treatment projects in this case. 
So that concludes our talk. Uh, I hope it has been helpful to you and will help you work on your water treatment project. This page here will show you some references and resources that were used in the creation of this webinar and may be helpful to you. You can see there's uh, several resources that are available from the EWB USA website, uh, such as the water quality testing guidance sheet, uh, the other two webinars, the water quality uh, webinar and the water supply webinar, uh, as well as the uh, distribution, the water distribution system webinar. Uh, there, there are other guidelines that are available on the EWE website. The rest of these are available from other resources such as the EPA and the World Health Organization and the USGS. So, with that, I would like to thank you for listening to this presentation, and I hope it has been useful. And with that, I will turn it over to the presenter, or to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. And thanks to our participants for your attention. I want to take this opportunity to again remind our participants that you must complete and submit your attendance on the following web page to receive credit for attending this program. This concludes today's program, Water Supply Part 3 of 3, Treatment, brought to you by Engineers Without Borders USA and Contract Solutions Group. Please check our online catalog often for the latest instructional programming from EWB USA and Contract Solutions Group. This program is copyright 2010 by EWB USA, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining us for this program, and enjoy the rest of your day.